welcome to this week's program. We're going to be meeting some of the enterprising women of the year. We'll also be talking irrigation and what you should be doing if you're wanting to buy or sell a farm. But in just a moment, it's cropping. Hail. Yes, Rob, hail. Um, we've had it and it's uh, indiscriminate where it, where it strikes and those that uh, have had it um, generally get it pretty badly and uh, their neighbours or, or even a fence over the paddock is not affected but I've had a look at some of the damage and um, it's quite substantial. You know, peas, barley, uh, brassicas absolutely stripped, just the leaves just all on the ground, the flowers on the ground and um, the stalk standing all bruised and uh, damaged so uh, that lends itself to um, uh, fungal and bacterial infections in the remaining plant if it hasn't completely been uh, been shot. Uh, if it's not looked after pretty soon, there will be um, bacterial and fungal diseases get into those, um, those plants. The only good thing about it is that it brings down nitrogen from the atmosphere when it comes down and possibly a bit of moisture. <laughs> possibly a bit of moisture. But it, it, where it's hit badly, it's been devastating. Absolutely, yeah, whether it be someone's home garden or um, paddocks of crop, doesn't matter what stage of development, they've been absolutely hammered and uh, even ryegrass had, had seeds knocked out of the head and uh, practically okay. useless and of course um, the, the forage market is a little bit depressed at the moment along with the um, dairy market so it's not even, uh, there's not a great deal of money to be made in turning it into hay or, um, or straw or whatever. Yep. Oh, our uh, thoughts are with them all. Absolutely. Tell me about this wheat bug. Yes, uh, Nisius huttoni is otherwise known as the wheat bug, uh, but probably is more destructive as a uh, bug of uh, brassicas. And um, what it does in a hot year, it loves a love a hot, dry year. And so um, we're having one of those and had one of those. <laughs> so <laughs> Apart it, from the hail. <laughs> exactly. So it's absolutely proliferated. And what it does is at, at ground level, it ring barks crops like uh, brassicas and um, even edible chrysanthemum, as I found out myself, is, is, is toppled over. Even, even flowering crops, it can drop them. And um, I have seen fodder beet that is something like about um, three inches across the bulb completely chopped out from both sides and the, the remaining bulb falls in half just because they've eaten right from the outside in. And indeed, it's very, very persistent. Um, we had to spray that paddock four times. The bug kept coming in from the surrounding uh, grasslands around and so it's very persistent. Its other horrible little habit is in uh, milling wheat. It dries in dry years and dry land crops especially at this time of the year where the, uh, the wheat is in the milk or the dough stage. The little bug climbs up the stem up into the grain, injects its enzyme into the individual grain and when you go to make bread out of that instead of that bread rising in the pan as it should do it stays as slop in the bottom. And, and you don't know. You don't know. But that is what is known as bug damaged wheat. A lot of farmers think bug damaged wheat is actually wheat that's in the silo and mm. has had something like the sawtooth grain beetle get into it and chomp away at it. That is not what is bug damaged wheat is. It's the Nisius no fly. For it all? Pardon? There's no test for it? Uh, yes, you can. You can. Uh, well, in the old days, they used to get a, um, a baking test done. And, uh, yeah, little the little wee tins. The wee the tins, wee tins yeah. and the wee loaves used to be produced. And a lot of that uh, d d found out early on whether it was bug damaged wheat. Mm. And of course, you know, completely hopeless for milling, but probably okay for feed. They're planning ahead for barley grass? Yes, farmers need to identify at this time of the year where their barley grass is. I don't know many farmers that have none. But those that have some will see it at this time of year, curse it at this time of year, and do nothing about it this time of year, except they may actually put some roundup over these areas, which all it does is open up the ground to the seeds that are in the ground from the previous year. <laughs> they will strike in the autumn and yeah, okay. after a rain. So they're creating a problem for themselves by actually tr thinking they're killing it and dropping the seed coming back. So things like Nortron, which are... Um, residual and will kill for a long period of time need to be applied in April and May when you can't see the barley grass. Mm. So what I'm really saying is see the barley grass areas now, identify them, take a note and treat them in April and May, not now. 
unless right. you're trying to stop it from sticking in the uh, the wool of sheep or something like that. Exactly. Now you mentioned bacterial diseases, but it, that was more specific. Yeah, bacterial diseases. Um, with the with the rain we've had and uh, the humidity we're having at the moment, a lot of bacterial diseases will s present themselves for the first time this season. And uh, of course, with irrigation, that aids it as well. And a lot of it can be the splashing from the soil up into the plant. But New Zealand is missing out on a lot of exports of um, crops because of bacterial diseases. And farmers don't really identify bacterial diseases well. They certainly know about fungarial diseases, but bacterial diseases like Xanthomonas, um, that can harbour itself on the seed and uh, can be detected. And overseas countries do not want to buy stuff that's Xanthomonas infected. And also um, bacterial soft rot or black leg, uh, which is known as FOMA. We're having a real issue with um, brassica seed into China at the moment, and we're not making a lot of headway, uh, I must say, and that's costing this country millions. So those bacterial things, they can hang around, can be a problem. We only really have three, three um, um, lots of armory available, and one is copper. Copper is a very good bactericide. One is uh, antibiotics, which we try not to use until um, absolutely essential, and the other is a disinfectant called spore kill. So that's about us. That's about us. Well, that's about us for the season too, buddy. Have a Merry Christmas and thank you once again for your undying support. In just a moment, we'll be meeting Jill, who's with Agracy, who are great sponsors and supporters of rural women. Absolutely. Our family and our company is delighted uh, to be part of Rural Women's Conference and particularly to support the love of the land category, especially this year. 2015 is a big year. Uh, the United Nations declared 2015 as the year of soil. Um, I was listening to you, darling, talking about water. You know, water is sort of the big, sexy, environmental one, you know. And we've totally forgotten about soil. And I guess in a way, <laughs> I love it though, I love it. Um, and one of the things that really uh, gets right up our nose up there in Pydor where, where, where I live is this whole business of bashing farmers, you know, for the environmental uh, problems of the world. Um, you see, it's hard for farmers because you have strategies that are, uh, you know, talking about leadership from fed farmers and things, organisations, Dairy New Zealand. Um, you have certain strategies that are, that are conventional and you know them and you're used to them. Um, in our line of work, we look at um, biological farming and it's fairly new in New Zealand, reasonably new, it's getting better known. I actually said to the, the young chap that's the head of um, Young Farmers, the national head, nice young chap at Mystery Creek. I said, our aim is to be mainstream. He said, I thought you were, you are. And I thought, wow, but, but, but we're not. Um, you see, you know, we're all across a, a, a spectrum, you know, from biodynamic, organic, high input chemical, and our job we see, although everything we make is certified organic, a tiny part of what we do is towards the organic sector. You know, you, you wouldn't, 30 families wouldn't survive in a business manufacturing biological inputs if you only uh, worried about the organic sector. Our main concern is this high chemical input sector coming more towards the middle of what we call biological farming. So that's our, that's our thing, we're so committed to it that next, oh, well, this year we actually took uh, Dr. Christine Jones on a tour of New Zealand. She's an amazing woman. She's a, a soil expert and she talks about how healthy soil functions, you know, and how it's absolutely not necessary to have so much uh, um, fertiliser. Amazing woman. So she's selling up, she's an Australian woman, and coming to live in Paidor, the hub of the universe. <laughs> and she's going to set up 
a research arm of Agracy because one thing that really gets up our nose there in lovely Pydal is it's not good enough to say to farmers, you have got to be careful of water, you do this, you do that, unless there are cost-effective, well-researched options for you, alternatives. So we see it as our absolute responsibility to head into a three-year research programme looking at six farms across this country, high chemical input farms. The first one we've already got, that's a, um, a forestry conversion in Rotorua. Um, and, and just really research it and show farmers the actual, you know, empirical uh, research results in order that you could perhaps look at changing some of the strategies. Isn't it wonderful to see individual companies such as hers getting in there and doing some research because research is where our future is. After the break, we're talking irrigation. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy, deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, onthelandco.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Tony, obviously Canterbury and parts of the North Island depend on irrigation, but not everybody sees it as a good thing. No, uh, there was a recent comment that uh, I heard on the radio. Uh, it was a Taranaki farmer commenting about um, it's time somebody got stuck into farmers in Canterbury who irrigate during during hot weather or even windy weather, hot and windy weather. And it's a complete misnomer because he, f he felt that everything that was being applied was evaporating. Well, that's a complete misnomer. It is a, it is a misconception, it's a wives' tale, and boy, you could even call it bunkum if you like. But there's been <laughs> well, plenty- let's call it bunkum. Yeah, let's call it bunkum, yeah. I mean, there's been plenty of research done on this, and we know that the typical losses to evaporation are less than 3%. So if you're applying water even on, on a 25 or 26, 28, 30 degree day, typically the losses are, are less than 3%. Um, with, and, and, they've, and that research is relatively old in the sense that it it's dates back to the sort of mid to late 90s. Uh, but and, and with modern sprinkler technology that we see on centre pivots and, and big linear irrigators where we're, where we're producing larger droplet sizes and they're relatively close to the soil surface, so we're you know, only 1.8 to 2 metres above the ground, uh, the chances of any of that water actually being able to have the temperature raised to the point that it could evaporate are, are pretty, pretty far-fetched. You know, that means you've got to try and take 11 or 12 degree water to the point that it can actually change from a, 
from a liquid state to a gaseous state, and that's just highly unlikely. There isn't enough time and there isn't enough energy to, to turn it. It's bumpkin. It is bumpkin, yeah. <laughs> the only exception to that probably is, is, is when we see these high-pressure guns, a single nozzle gun trying to throw water into a, into a howling wind, and then what happens is that that wind breaks up all your droplets into very, very fine particles. So then they are much more susceptible to some evaporation. But the losses to evaporation are really tiny. It is the, it is the wind blowing it off target or the, the fact that we have non-uniform irrigation. So every area is not getting the same amount of water that are the big losses in irrigation. And, that, and that's where the effort goes. Uh, with with technology and, and the way farmers manage their systems and, and sort of when they do some irrigation or how they adjust their, their, their runs to make sure they get their water where they need it to be. Now Ken Rings making a name for himself again. Oh yes, um, another radio um, <laughs> interview. I've heard, I've heard it actually several times on the radio talking about El Nino and that it's uh, A, that it's weak, um, that it's all that's what all the talk is about it's waning it's nearly neutral um a whole lot of things about it and in, in other words it's 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 sort of a you know it's it's not really a big deal you know well tell the farmers in in parts of north canterbury and southern eastern the wider rapper and parts of south canterbury and to an extent canterbury and north otago as a whole at the moment and blenheim that el nino is not biting um, i think they'll tell you that that um uh, it is certainly biting. I mean, and it's we, biting hard. And it's biting very hard, yeah. So if you look at all the statistics, all the indicators of El Nino, they are very, very strong. I mean, sea temperatures, pressures, the Southern Oscillation Index, everything's showing that this is a very strong El Nino, and it is very similar to 97, 98. And farmers who are listening to this will remember in both the North Island and the South Island East Coast areas, what 97, 98 was, and it was a very bad drought that lasted well into the autumn. And all the indications, if you listen to or read what they're saying from, from some of the Australian sites and from Niwa, this is going to not wane until we get into the autumn. But you get, you get some idiot who says that it's not, and of course the, the city dwellers go, well, what's all the fuss about? That's right. There is a big fuss about this, you know, and we've known for a, for a long time this year that El Nino is coming. It is every month that is showing signs of strengthening and, it, and it's doing nothing, nothing different right now. Um, and then you get a hailstorm. And then we get a hailstorm. I mean, um, yep, uh, Canterbury got hit quite badly. Parts of Canterbury got quit, hit quite badly by hail uh, on, on last Sunday. And um, there's, we know there's a lot of damaged uh, vining peas that are about a week out from being harvested. Not 100% sure whether those are going to be harvested or not. A um, lot, of, lot of bruised pods, probably bruised peas underneath. We know there's wheat being knocked out of the heads and it's on the ground. We know winter barley's being knocked out of the heads and it's on the ground. Um, just how severe that is, um, you know, when it comes to those crops, you don't know until you put the header through them, really. But it's, you know, it's pretty disheartening. We've got to this point oh, in a tough totally. season when, uh, you know, they've had to irrigate continuously to get them to that point. And you get, you know, maybe, I don't know what the losses will be, 10, 20, 30% knocked out of the heads and it's on the ground. And Not I mean, it's, there's no coming back from that. I mean, oh, no. You're going to lose a lot of money. Yeah, you can't. Um, you know, the grain's immature. You can't go through them vacuum it up off the ground or anything like that, it's, um, it's history, you know. Um, and the peas might be history too, they might have um, bailage value only. Looking forward, it's just going to be yeah, to I, basically battle down, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is going to be battle down. I mean, we are very strongly, I mean, everybody, everybody can see it. Doesn't matter whether you're a city dweller or whether you're a person in the country, we can see it. We are in this strong westerly, Northwesterly, southwesterly pattern, and when we get those southwesters, they're getting driven by some pretty cold air from way down south, and we could uh, get similar weather to Sunday again. Tony, thank you very much indeed for your support, and have a merry Christmas despite the weather. And you too. <laughs> Thanks. In just a moment, we're going to meet one of the finalists from the Enterprising Women of the Year Awards. Okay. Good evening, everybody, uh, ladies, and the eight gentlemen. Uh, it's it's lovely to be recognised by the by the Rural Women's um, committee, committee and group. Uh, my enterprise is Carbon Streetwear. It is a fashion and clothing footwear and accessory store in Gore. 
We are based in a, in a rural town, so I'm dressing and supporting our local community and the surrounds. And my motivation was because of the lack of selection available for myself, my family and friends. We always had to go further afield, as many of you probably find living in a rural community to get what you want. 11 years on, after I first opened, I pride myself on the fantastic relationships I still have kept with my current staff, suppliers and the good name I do have in the rag trade industry. My team and I pride ourselves on top service. This is our uniqueness. Having recently been recognised by New Zealand Retail, that we, are the top, we were the top regional winners for Otago and Southland taking away four awards and then going on to become the runners-up to the National Supreme Award for New Zealand. That was over, out of 600 entries, so we're really proud of that being a small rural store. <laughs> Our products and service are quality and we love to go that extra mile. Uh, part of our strategies of keeping up with, with our city counterparts has been being aware of the trends and technologies and keeping up with them, always weighing up the effectiveness of the potential of these trends and getting it right is obviously the key. Social media is definitely something that uh, we choose to invest a lot of time and effort in. That's uh, a key part of our target market and it gives us an opportunity to showcase our business and the interests of both my passion for farming and retail. So I love connecting with the town, city and country folk and sharing my knowledge of both through all the social media platforms. And of course that goes along with the youth as well. Uh, looking, looking after my staff is also very important to me and offering them education, team building activities and giving them ownership of their job. My team are all encouraged to develop themselves and skills and I help them through a study program up to level fourth with Service IQ. In the past five years, my Carver members have consistently been finalists in the retail awards as well for Service IQ, and this, this year one of them taking out the national title, which I'm very proud of. So, and I'm a community focused person, as spoken before, with working with youth, um, but as a retailer, I have the opportunity to invest in our district and do as much as I can for our local rural communities. So my staff and I participate in community fundraisers, we donate and I also donate a lot of my time and sponsor numerous events and sports teams as well. Aware the rural, dying, rural towns are dying, this is something else I've become passionate about and many of you will notice that our towns are getting smaller and the social impact it has on losing retail stores in our towns. Along with our Mayor and a steering committee, my next challenge is to revive our local rural town, Gore. So we're going to do that by mentoring and encouraging retailers so that they don't need to close their store doors. Um, so building great relationships with, with the rural and city and town folk and being able to share my knowledge of both between the two is, has, is sort of part of, of my success, I guess, because I can connect the two, bridging that gap, so to speak. Um, and that's reflected in my thriving business and, of course, our farm business. So thank you very much again, Royal Womans, and I appreciate this award. We're going to be meeting more of the finalists here on the land. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? 
Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Hello everyone, I'm Bridget Canning, part owner of Wiswalis Limited, with my husband John, one of the eight down in that wee group there. We are sheep and beef farmers northeast of Marston in a small community called Tinui, approximately one hour from Masterton, in what some call a remote rural community, a bit like Ikatahuna, only smaller. Thanks for this opportunity for sharing a beef outline of some of the things I have done to date. I have always had a project on the go and work around both the family and the farm needs. Like most of you, over the years I've had many support roles within our community, starting at school with fellow, helping fellow students understand maths and physics, then a girl guide leader when we farmed in central Hawke's Bay. And when we came back to Tinui, we managed the farm for my parents and both our children were born. I joined the Women's Division of Federated Farmers, the predecessor of your rural women, and was chosen to go on a mini Kellogg leadership course in 1984, which gave me the confidence to accept many of the new roles I've done over the years. While the children were young, I joined the local play centre and trained to be a national supervisor and a relief centre advisor for Wairapa. One of the first jobs was a fellow tutor on the big yellow computer bus, which went around all the rural schools in the Wairapa. It was full of computers and printers, and they were all networked together. This was the first taste of computers for many children and their parents. We ran various courses on using emails and writing letters. Since then, I've looked for various ventures I could do based from home including a mix of tutoring and support positions and many community executive positions within our region. It was also at this time I started Oakburn Nurseries, a perennial herb and old-fashioned old rose nursery. We purchased our first computer in 1984 and helped develop a software program to print out tough lock tags to go on these plants. Our garden was open for many years until the massive floods in the early 1990s when our home had to be relocated and the nursery closed. After the floods, I became a support person for CRS, computer concepts in those days, and ran many training courses over the years. And I often wonder if perhaps some of you have been on some of those courses that I took at that time. Then on the courses, I help people with their data, including preparing budgets and how to get the most out of their computers and software, which evolved into the next business venture, Canning & Associates. At its height, I had a team of 15 associates working with farming and business clients throughout the Wairapa. More and more often, I was asked to support clients by phone rather than going to their site and realised to see what was on the computer would be much easier, so we obtained some internet at the office. We were one of the first businesses in Masterton to get Jetstream, the forerunner to ADSL, VDSL, and of course Fibre. But many of our clients were still on dial-up as we were at home. So I know firsthand what a handicapped slow internet can be. I wanted to work from home but there were very few broadband available, options available. Even now, we still aren't covered by the government's most recent 
rural RBI project. Back in 2005, we decided to do something about it, so we approached the local Wairapa wireless internet provider as to what was involved in giving us internet at home. The cost to build the infrastructure was so great that we did some more planning and decided to own it ourselves. And with support from the farm, and offer internet to our neighbours. So we rose to the challenge. This proved to be a huge learning curve for us, but one that we've grasped with both hands. Two years later, we purchased that same local wireless internet provider. And we've expanded our network to provide rural wireless broadband in all areas of the Wairapa and parts of Tauroa. We build the infrastructure and sell most of the, uh, sorry, we go into areas seen as hard by most of the other internet providers and that's one of the strategies that we've got that we're prepared to go into those areas that no one else wants to go into. We build the infrastructure and sell the broadband services over that infrastructure including up to a 50-50 financial arrangement for those local communities and we can go into those small pockets of where those rural residents are. We now have a successful business which has won various industry awards recognising these events. I'm sure all of you have first-hand stories of knowing someone who has slow internet, and you wish someone would just sort it for you. Well, there is. Every region in New Zealand has a small terrestrial wireless internet provider like us. So go and find them and talk to them about what you need, and I'm sure they can do something for you. We are continually upgrading the radio equipment on WIS Wireless to the latest technology, and our subscribers used to get two megabits per second, which was a fast rural ADSL. Whereas now it can be up to 30 megabits per second, the same as an entry urban UFB speed. I strongly believe that rural speeds should be the same or better than urban speeds, and we are doing something about that. In the future, we will be able to offer up to 100 megabits per second for everyone. We have sent in a submission to be part of the RBI2 rollout. Imagine how many more rural residences we could connect with a little bit of government help. We're in the business of linking people using broadband. Our approach is to keep broadband low tech and we want to link people to business, parents to children and give power users the ability to develop their own innovative projects. So what is the future for me? I've gone from being full time at the office from being two days, and the other days are working from home. So my dream is now a reality. I am working from home. Tomorrow I head to Canada to join my daughter and family and hold my new granddaughter, while still being connected to my business and home. Skype is great but being there will be wonderful. Still working remotely, but having the life choices as well. Thank you to Rural Women, thank you, <laughs> for recognising the work that John and I have been able to achieve in the Wairapa, and we look forward to meeting the next challenge, whatever that may be. Thank you. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing you to another finalist from the Enterprising Woman of the Year. Good evening everybody and I'd just like to say a big thank you to Rural Women for um, making these awards possible and keeping them going year on year and recognising the amazing um, abilities and uh, entrepreneurship and innovation that's going on out in the rural industry by our women. I'd also like to congratulate you on your 90th conference. Um, one of my roles is the president for Taranaki Federated Farmers and last year we so, um, celebrated our 50th conference and I know how, um, what a huge milestone that is for an organisation to get that far and to keep sustainably going forward. I'd also like to thank Ericom for this award and for sponsoring it and when I read through the brief um, on Kerry's business I thought there were a few synergies there with what um, On Farm Safety has been through. So a little bit about me. I grew up in Wongamomana in eastern Taranaki and in 1984 I went against my father's wishes and decided that I didn't want to be a nurse or a teacher and I went to Flock House. I trained as a shepherd and in my time um, 
whistling dogs and picking up a handpiece. Um, it set me up for what has become a very sustainable farm business with my husband Phil and Ethan, um, <laughs> who uh, make up the support team of the men, um, and our two beautiful daughters who are very much involved in our farm business and very much in the agricultural industry. We uh, now own a, a, the equivalent of 700 cows, uh, dairy cows in Taranaki, and it has been a long business growth and a hard fought 24 hour, seven day a week business development of which we are very proud. In my role in Taranaki Federated Farmers and also as a trustee for the Taranaki Rural Support Trust, about five years ago, I started to get a wind of the health and safety legislation that was coming at us like a steam train. It was a fast moving beast that our industry couldn't quite get its head around. And we were being portrayed as um, people who were out there not caring about their employees and rapidly killing off or um, injuring our workers at a great rate of knots. <coughs> I had involvement with uh, training organisations and also at a national level with New Zealand Young Farmers running the New Zealand Agri-Kids programme. And in my, do in my um, workings with the farmers around the country, the category title of this award, Help I Need Somebody, fits perfectly into what farmers were asking of me in my background in training, the industry and basic health and safety training. So what started out as being just myself, um, helping farmers to put in workable, practical health and safety systems that worked for them, um, whether they be owners, uh, a governance, a board, managers or staff, has turned into, in three years, a very fast-growing, sustainable brand on Farm Safety New Zealand that now employs 13 people around New Zealand. The people we've brought into the team, or more should I say, the people who have come to us and asked us to be a part of what we have started, are all farming themselves, and that is our strength. Our consultants, whether they're full-time or contractors, are industry savvy. They're all farming, they can all get a dirty pair of gum boots or work boots out of the back of the ute and talk farming with their farming clients. And that carries a massive amount of weight. As many farmers say to us, don't send me one of those shiny shoe people up my driveway and tell, get them to tell me how to do health and safety. So it's been a huge pleasure and privilege to be able to grow a business and bring people from in our, within our industry into this business who know farming really well, who are passionate about our industry not being portrayed in such a poor light that we are the worst as far as statistics go um, in, in our workplaces, and who have ability to bring in a little bit more income, be part of a growing, exciting team around the country, and s set our industry up as industry leaders in the health and safety space, not being pushed into the corner as the regulator at the moment would have us, uh, or how it would come across. What's the future for On Farm Safety New Zealand? We've just been through a big strategy review. We've grown very quickly. It's been a huge learning curve for Phil and I. Um, we see ourselves now as being one of New Zealand's, or the New Zealand leading specialist in the health and safety field. Why? Because we've got a great team. Why? Because we know the legislation and we know where it's going and we know how to apply it to our industry. The future for on-farm safety is looking really good. Uh, it's been a month of accolades for us. Uh, recently I was also nominated as a woman of influence um, in the Westpac rural, uh, rural category. And also we've done quite well in our local awards in the TSB Chamber of Commerce Awards where we won the Innovation Entrepreneur Award and we got a highly commended for our service to the industry award. We're very proud to be able to keep our business Taranaki based. 
Why? Because there are some brilliant skills in support and in an advisory and mentor and we, we're finding all the skills we need to help grow our business right in Taranaki and we, we want to keep it that way. So the future for on-farm safety looks really good. Health and safety is something as an industry we need to lead on, not be pushed into a corner by. And I think um, we have that ability to do that and set up um, industry standards that work for us practically and work for us individually on each of our farms. So thank you again for this award. After the break, we'll be meeting yet another of our enterprising women and we'll also be talking real estate. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We'll get you thinking, think water. I think it's all working well, Jack. My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking, think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking, think water. It's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of everything. We'll get you thinking, think water. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. I grew up on the family sheep farm in Napdale in Southland. And as a teenager, I used to ask my dad if I could go around the sheep with him on Saturday mornings. And he always said, stay home and help your mother. <laughs> so after hearing that a few times, well, quite a few times, didn't really resonate with me as a viable long-term alternative. So in the sixth form, I got a job a few kilometres down the road in a plant nursery, and that's how I got into horticulture. My business is Plant Hawks Bay Limited, a native plant nursery. We specialise in growing eco-sourced Hawks Bay plants. When I started up 10 years ago, I thought that if I simply grew good plants, and more of them every, every year, they would sell themselves and my business would succeed. But instead, I found that building a business is a bit more complex. It's all about looking after customers and numbers and money. It's also about promotion, building a fantastic team, problem solving, having faith in yourself and having really clear goals. Our nursery goals are threefold. One, to be the preferred supplier of native plants in Hawke's Bay. Two, to grow a profitable and sustainable business. And three, to help save rare plant species. When I divorced in 2005, it freed up some capital and quite a lot of energy to set up the business. 
I, <coughs> I didn't have enough money to buy any land, so I decided leasing was a better idea. Um, I lease exactly an acre from Landcorp's Ahereri station, and when you sit at Napier Airport and you look out across the runway, you can see my greenhouse sticking up a bit on the other side of the runway. I have um, a full-time staff member, and she's an apprentice as well, Sarah Gordon, and a part-time university student, Tane Foreman, and together we grow 85,000 plants a year at the moment, and this has been increasing all the time. We wholesale plants and contract grow for farmers, lifestyle block owners, landscapers, and for specific conservation projects like kakabeek restoration. You can see I've got some kakabeek photos in the, behind me on there. 10 years ago, I started out with a shed and an empty paddock, and first I built a greenhouse, and then each year added a bay and that takes a gravel base, posts and wire, weed mat, shade cloth, irrigation. Now it's completely developed. So at the same time, we increase the plants and the market a bit every year. To help cash flow that development, I keep working part-time as a freelance rural journalist, telling other people's stories. I've cut this back to give more energy to the business now, but I still do a day or two a month as a researcher for the TV show Rural Delivery, for Agmart, which is the funding good fairy no one has ever heard of, and I have a new environmental column with New Zealand Farmers Weekly. So that was the last 10 years, and then the, my goal for the next 10 years is to maximise the returns from my investment. And part of this is to tell the stories of our plants to the customers. It's good fun having school and polytech students visit the nursery, and it takes me back to when I was studying horticultural science at Lincoln. But growing the business has been much harder than I naively anticipated at the start. In 2006, I climbed Tapu Iyanuku in the inland Kaikoura's, it's the tallest mountain there. I was a bit daunted by the prospect, but the good friend who took me up the mountain reassured me by saying, don't worry, we'll just chip away at it. So I learned that lesson, and at work my policy has been the same, not to be overwhelmed, but to chip away build the best professional support all around and keep improving things. And the business has grown from $6,000 of sales in the first year to $187,000 so far this year, and we still have a few months to go. More than 80% of our sales are to repeat clients, and they're the ones that do the best job for us promoting the business. My other promotional vehicle is my car, which you can see a bit in the background. About east of this year, I had it covered in plant photos and um, that I've taken, and it's been a great move, really good promotional tool. A witty friend of mine suggested that when I write the car off, which um, I'm really looking forward to, <laughs> that we pop the windscreen out and use it for a Mai Mai. <laughs> so just to summarise, I think business should be a win-win for all the people involved. I really enjoy working with our staff, our suppliers, and landlord Landcorp, and have fantastic customers, including the prospective Mai Mai owner. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today at your conference and to tell you my story. And thank you so much to the sponsors and to Rural Woman. Poor farms are getting more and more expensive by the day, so therefore I guess preparation before you put your property on the market is important? Yes, a lot of engagement required. Rob, not just with uh, the farmer themselves, but quite often their professional advisors. And um, there's a process we go through to, to make sure we've got all the I's dotted and T's crossed before we bring it to market. So you need a lead in time, obviously. You're looking at 12 months or less? In some cases, up to 12 months, because um, you may need to get irrigation consents lined up, compliance with effluent, course, yeah. all sorts of things. And so we bring in professional advisors because um, you know, we haven't got those skills and to, to go around and check that sort of thing and where it's quite obvious there's something needed and uh, it can take 12 months to put it all in place. And you guess your lawyers and accountants? Yeah, try and work as a team, bring everybody in, get around the table, um, the farmer, his wife, sometimes you know the, the kids are working on the farm, get everybody on the same page and so when you do get to market, you you've present the property well, take out all the ifs and buts. So we're very keen to get have a sort of a, 
a strategic meeting, if you like, before the listing takes place and get everything ticked off. Because there would be an instinct, I guess, to say, look, I've had enough. I'm just, I'm going to go into town. Let's put the place on the market and expect to be in there by Christmas, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, look, in some cases it's possible because, you know, some people have already done their homework. I guess the key thing for us is to ask the right questions and, and, and know what we need before we need it. So then we can make a decision with the farmers and then say, look, there's a few things missing here that we probably need to tidy up. Because all that'll happen is you'll get to sale date and a solicitor or, or an accountant or an environmental consultant that the buyer's dealing with will pick a fault. And the last thing you want to do is go right through the process, get to the conditional stage, and then find that the, the, the deal's not going to work on the day just because we haven't done our homework. Yeah, right. And you guys are now, by law, you've got sort of indemnities and you've, you can't sort of sweep anything out of the carpet. Well, we never did anyway. Right? No, no, but <laughs> do you know what I'm saying is you know, you, you are liable and, and, yeah. and it's good. Yeah, oh, I think it's great. It, it, it's making the whole industry more professional and likewise we're upskilling all our staff to be more, you know, to more technical knowledge because if you don't know what you don't know, you, you can never give advice. Mm, mm. And, um, and where we don't know something, I think the key thing is don't pretend we know or we'll fluff it, as you say. Is, is to bring in professional advisors, people who do know, so that we, uh, you know, well, we save our own skin to a degree, but we also save the farmer a lot of money eventually as well. Well, exactly. And tell me about the homestead, because invariably, in the past, farmers have bought a farm and there happened to be a house on it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's all changed. I mean, the, the value of these properties nowadays, some of them are, are worth as much as a small public company. So the, the people who've got you know, $10 million worth of equity, or in some cases I've got clients who've got hundreds and hundred million dollars worth of equity. They're not, um, you know, they're not that keen anymore on having a, a three bedroom, 1200 square foot house anymore. And, and that, that's fair. I mean, you, if, you want to, if you want to get good managers, good staff, and you want to present the property to be, you know, a, a desirable asset, you, you've got to have good housing. Yeah, but the old days are gone. Which is good again isn't it? Oh, I think so, yeah. 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 Because I would have thought that you you look at the homestead because the people who are going to be living in it, you, you need to cater for them very well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think people's acceptance of, of, of what's good enough has, has certainly gone up a notch. And it's not unusual, I guess, because a lot of the, well, my experience, and probably you're about the same era, would be that post-war, you may do. Mm. And, and that's changed now. Which is good. So the main key comment really is lawyers, accountants, any consultants, and you around the table. Yeah. Well a, in advance. Yeah, have a team meeting. And I mean, I don't know people's financial situations. I don't know the way they've necessarily got their legal entities set up. So ideally, you get those people in sooner rather than later, mm -hmm. and it all comes out on the table. You get a package together when we go to market. The buyers aren't asking for this, this, this and this. It's all presented to them in a package. And you guys are very professional. I've seen the way you, you present properties. Marketing, I mean, it's a lot of it's online now. Yeah, the, the, it is largely online. I guess that probably 70% of our inquiry now is coming via the internet. Often it's not direct. Sometimes they'll see it in the paper and then go to the website and have a look. So you've still got to use both mediums. Mm. So it's, it's not one size fits all, because there are a group of people out there that aren't internet connected still. So we've designed marketing packages to try and encompass everything and everybody. And but, it's a big broad net, like the whole of New Zealand and overseas can, can get a hold of a website. Yeah, yeah, no stone left unturned. It's about doing it sensibly though. I mean, you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of marketing. We try and clip the packages to what works best for the amount of money that you're prepared to invest. Yeah, and of course, the more you invest, the more coverage you do get to a degree. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much indeed, because it's an exciting business to be in at the moment. Oh, I love it. You're unemployed every day, and you get out there and see what happens. It's uh, <laughs> like going to the races, but it is, it's a good industry. <laughs> well, Paul, thank you for coming in, and a Merry Christmas to you. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I'm Rob Cope-Williams. You've either been watching, or you have just missed the program, but I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.